Good afternoon. My name is Antoine Le Boyer, and as usual, I can't see you, but I'm probably assuming that, that I'm the oldest guy in the room, which means that I can remember a world without Excel, and I can tell you that when Excel arrived, there was no panel on Excel for good. <laughs> So, this being said, uh, AI for good is something with these, which has captured a lot of imagination and I'm very glad that we have uh, great speakers from the government, the corporate world and the startup and academia to be able to go further. Bjorn, we've heard what you do, we do. Can we ask our uh, guests to introduce themselves a little more? Paola? Yeah, pleasure to be here. Paula Cipier is my name. Uh, I'm the head of privacy and public policy for Palantir Technologies in Europe. Uh, a company that builds software uh, applications for both the government uh, and the private sector to enable them to integrate harmonies and make better use of their data. Marco? Um, yes, Marco Alexander Breit. I have a pretty political background, but for I think eight years now, I'm doing um, um, digital policy. As of now, I'm responsible in the German Ministry of Economic Affairs for AI, data, digital technologies, culture and creativity, and gaming, which gives me kind of um, a lot of different views on the topic of AI and how it uh, impacts especially white-color creative jobs. Let's get started. <clears throat> Paula, how we've heard of uh, AI, you know, wiping humanity and so on. So how much credential do you give to this unbelievable threat? Yeah, so actually, I'm glad that Bjorn gave the talk right before this panel, because I think that contextualizes um, quite a bit the conversation we're having now. I do believe that the advancements that have been made in artificial intelligence, particularly when it comes to generative AI, have been impressive. Um, but I'm a little skeptical personally about these analogies to nuclear bombs or like weapons of math destruction, because if we think about it carefully, the two things aren't comparable at all, right? If you take a nuclear bomb, right, it literally has one purpose. It is a weapon of mass destruction, right? Um, but AI can be used in manifold purposes, right? It can be used for good, it can be used for bad. It's also not one technology, right? I see. I think we see at the regulatory level already that it's actually quite challenging to define what AI even is. So I think what probably makes more sense in this context, particularly when we look at the risks, is to um, carefully look at what kind of AI models we're talking about, the context in which they are applied, and the kinds of benefits and risks that go along in those contexts. Because I think the the challenge of, of creating these large-scale um, analyses is that they both catastrophize and in a way distract from the actual risks of AI models. Marco, when we were listening to Bjorn, you saw the three covers and you wanted to make a point uh, about uh, AI and unemployment. Yes, but maybe later because um, I think the more important topic right now is Bjorn... Uh, you obviously brought a lot of topics that are super important and we rely on a, a, a lot of views. I would, I would kind of, if I may, um, it's not a nuclear bomb that's comparable to AI. It's nuclear technology. Because nuclear technology can be used for nuclear energy or for nuclear bombs. So if you, there's a good thing about it and there's a bad thing about it, I think AI has the potential to do both. And I am not worried um, um, whether whether AI robots will kill us all, but I am worried about bad actors, as you mentioned, Bjorn, will take the technology to, um, if you take into account the virus that has that kept us busy for the last four years now, if this is artificially enhanced, uh, even more contagious, even more robust when it comes to mutations and all this stuff, then it's really, really, really dangerous. If we take into account that there's only a couple of companies in the world that can um, keep us, um, or that can save us from orchestrated AI-enhanced cyber attacks. If you take into account that fake news can be used as a political leverage in, in dire times, if it's orchestrated, if it's well done, if it's more than just one video or one photo, that's published but on orchestrated campaign, then this is something that we should worry about and this is something that you cannot regulate because as it is, the bad actors, they don't care about regulation. Be them either national bad actors or international bad actors because it's just a playground for powers. Bjorn, you've used the word democratize when talking about the technology. So do you think it was responsible? Are the right things to democratize something which is so powerful and so quickly? I think that AI is developed worldwide and with that I believe we cannot locally stop it but we can locally steer it in directions where we actually would want to have it rather go. When we were developing stable diffusion we saw that in a short amount of time this technology will be much better and will be widely used out there. So the question was like we just wait for it then to be there and just like pop up and what I've realized in talking to a lot of 
uh, journalist and so on, that apparently a lot of education was needed to understand what the risks are with this technology being there. Ordinary users asking a lot of important questions. And I guess we better answer these questions at a stage, back in the day when Stable Diffusion, when we released that, where you could not take all of the images for face value. Rather than wait so long till the images become Im ever better, and then we are there. Now, the question open source whether or, or, or closed source, We've seen tons of examples over the last couple of months of closed source technology being either leaked, in the case of Facebook, a large language model, or being re-implemented by others. So the only strategy there that I actually see would be to ban research in that particular direction, which comes at an enormous cost. And doing that worldwide, I see as a very tricky thing to actually implement. If you allow me one last word on the nuclear bomb that we used to have here, or the nuclear technology that you said beforehand, I see, however, a huge discrepancy there. The nuclear technology, there's good reasons why. I mean, who of you owns uh, plutonium or uranium? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, not really, right? Because there's uh, only like one good thing that you may be doing with that, yeah, a power a nuclear power plant apart from the bomb. But with AI, it's different. There's tons of reasons why all of you own your own graphics cards and so on. And that makes actually for a huge difference there with this technology. Marco, I want to come back to regulation because the speed with which the technology evolve, is evolving is probably something which is unbelievable. So how do you as a regulator uh, manage to keep ahead of all what's happening, incorporate all these massive changes? Yes, this is pretty difficult. First of all, as Bjorn already said, AI technology is global while regulation is only local. And if we take into account that the EU um, AI Act right now focuses on the European Union, it's a territorial concept, which means that whatever we decide on, um, um, on how, to, how we allow AI to be used or um, created or designed, um, only has a regional impact, while other gl huge global powers like US, like China, do whatever they want to do. And then there is the thing that for the next three years, these technology or these regulation will be implemented and companies will try to find a way how to deal with these regulatory affairs and all this stuff. So in the next three years, there will be, um, the EU will be regulated, maybe for, uh, if, if we can finish by the end of the year, we will be have, uh, we have, we have a regulation, then it will be three years and where this regulation will be finally settling into place while the others do whatever they want to do. And the second thing is um, that for the first time, which is a difficulty too, for the first time in human history, I think, um, we are regulating something that not only the government or the regulators do not understand, but the people designing the AI do not understand either. You set the black box. The thing is, when we regulated cars, at least the engineers of Mercedes, uh, Gottfried Daimler, he understood how a car is working, right? When we um, regulated aviation, we understood the laws of thermodynamics. But now we try to regulate AI, and when I was in the valley talking to the big two companies, and I asked them, how, is that, how does that work? They were actually, they didn't have good answers. And they are worried about that too. So this is kind of a, um, this is a problem from a regulatory perspective, and it gets even worse when you put that doom crisis argument into account, when people say, look, I'm going to drive in my car 120 miles per hour towards that wall, and you either take the wall away or you regulate me, but I will not stop. I'd actually like to add one point to that. I, I agree that there's, there are regional differences between the way that AI regulation is approached and the EU is certainly pressing ahead. Um, but I think um, what's interesting to note there is that the EU AI Act is actually quite similar to the EU general data protection uh, regulation, that it's just not just applied to companies in the EU, but any company wanting to operate with AI in the European Union, right? And that is actually quite a powerful regulatory force, right? Um, some of you may know this as the Brussels effect as well, that other jurisdictions start developing uh, and applying similar laws as well. Um, and I think we see in the United States as well efforts to create regulation as well um, and American and European counterparts being in close contact about this as well. Um, I think the, the bigger question um, will be precisely one that Bjorn raised in, the, in his previous talk about values, right? Which values do we want these systems to represent? We see in China as well AI regulation um, that uh, asks essentially of the developers and deployers of AI to implement communist values, right? Um, the U.S. is proposing democratic values, right? Um, the EU AI Act, a lot of the work preceding the EU AI Act emphasized the importance of um, 
supporting the development of human-centric and ethical AI, right? But then ethical is also like a really tricky term. Like how do you define it in practice? And a lot of software engineering is also about trade-offs. So how do you make the decision as to like how to balance different values in the software engineering uh, development process in practice? And I think here actually, um, on the regulatory side, it would probably be helpful to have much more concrete guidance also at the organization level. How can ethical deliberation be implemented in software engineering processes? And there's actually a great research group at TU Munich um, that associated with the Bavarian Institute for Digital Transformation that is working precisely on this ethical deliberation and agile software development processes part. If I may, this is, this is exactly the point. If you take the, one of the hot topics in Brussels and in the member states uh, capitals right now is biometric recognition. And some people say we need to ban biometric recognition from our um, from the European Union as a whole because if you don't, do not want that technology, we can, it can be misused, like social scoring and all the other things. And then there's the people who say yes, but what if kids have been kidnapped? And you could use the data from a camera on a on a on a, on a main sta on a train station to find the kidnapper and the kid, obviously. So sh why shouldn't we allow it in retrograde? Uh, a few hours or days after that, um, the, the video has been taken, you can still use biometric recognition to find out who's on that tape. So what I try to say is the ethical debate is pretty complex and it is complex within the European Union which is a value system and it is more complex if the European Union is talking to the US and it gets really really complex if the US and, the, and China try to align on ethical values so this is I think ethics is important but it's not global. Beyond as the the professor here there was something that was mentioned which is that this is a, you know as you've said this is a black box and indeed uh, there's a lot of research made be at Tell him you are tomorrow in the valley about criteria to be able to decide how to deploy uh, a new AI, how to measure its effectiveness. What's the state of the art? Do you think that there's going to be something that will mean that we'll be able to deploy AI with, I would say, the same level of comfort as we'll deploy classic IT? So, first off, there's a lot of work in the direction of making AI more transparent and explainable. My team and many others are researching in that direction as well. Um, it is a, a powerful, complex technology, and with that, uh, it's no wonder that understanding how, at the end of the day, decisions are, how it works, I believe we, we have a much better understanding, but how the eventual decisions come to place, um, that is evidently then more challenging if that's actually a powerful technology. But there's work in that direction. I don't think that we should hope for an all-up technical solution. At the end of the day, it's our brains and our eyes that are the final filter when it comes down to uh, taking content, for instance, from the web and uh, doing, for instance, um, uh, selection strategies, whether something is um, faked or not. Uh, so that's one of these big questions. If you give me a 30 pixel sized image, which is taken at night or whatever else from a war zone, how should an AI or whatever? Any journalist knows that you need to uh, check, in that case, other sources. But then comes the question of regulation there. And with regulation, I feel like I, much has been said here. So what I want to add there is that we are only in the, so to speak, luxurious situation in the future that we actually can talk about regulation if we have a certain independence. We've seen that with energy before, and as I said in the talk, that if we become too dependent on this technology, which I believe in the future will be critical for all in society and business that we have, if we become too dependent on foreign entities, foreign companies, foreign countries uh, with this technology, there will be coming a point in the future where we will be just saying like, hey, please give us access and with that we accept anything that you have. You have this with the little tick boxes that you have when, you're, uh, when you surf the internet, eventually comes the point where they're either becoming so nerve-wracking or you just have to sign yeah, because you need actually this particular product. That is a direction where I don't want to go. That was the reason why we democratized this research there so that it's not just a few key players out there. But I, as a researcher, can only go so far. What I need, on the other hand, and that is something where, what, what I want for our continent here and for our country, is a certain resource independence. And I strongly believe that in the future, compute will be as critical of a commodity as it is electricity and water and so on for research and for our society in general. And if we don't make sure that we very quickly there become more independent from a few large companies, we will not be talking about regulation there anymore. It's infrastructure. Also, if I may. It is infrastructure. If I may uh, stay on regulation, can you explain what is the notion of risk, which is uh, probably at the heart of the way the EU Act is looking at the applications? 
um, this is exactly the point. The EU AI Act right now tries to address AI from its use. So it is, it's, whether it is a high-risk application or a high-risk case for the application, or it, whether it's, there is a low-risk application or no risk at all. And as of now, there is a fourth layer of risk assessment being put in the negotiations, especially when it comes to generative AI, which is another large problem. Um, I don't want to bore you with um, government procedure, but when the, the member states issued their collective opinion on how to regulate AI, and I was part of that negotiation, it was November 2022. And the ChatGPT hype started in December 2023. And then everybody in the beginning was like super, uh, uh, super uh, uh, in, 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 enticed about um, AI and about ChatGPT. And afterwards, they became uh, they slowly became a bit more thoughtful. And then they, uh, they, the fears started to rise. What I try to say is, six months ago, ChatGPT wasn't even an issue in the AI Act. And now, right now, we try to formulate an opinion on how to address the generative AI issue within the AI Act, which means that from that how we can use AI, how the application, whether it's a high-risk assessment, whether it's a high-risk application, doesn't work with generative AI because in the end, generative AI has, by per se, per definition, not an exact use case. And with that, we need to be, and that I believe strongly here, need to be careful. If we now want to regulate, as you just said, technology which hasn't even been developed and want to now already have a blueprint for how we will actually deal with that, the chances are, and that's what I've seen in November, for instance, back in the day, that we will create huge gray areas just so that from a political point of view, we can say like we've been taken care of that, but that ain't going to help nobody. And that's not going to help the users and that's not going to help the companies. Be at the end of the day, it's going to be judges and courts that will then make the decision with that we are in, in, in the place where we started. So I, I guess we need to embrace the fact that now legislation needs to develop, probably sometimes also a bit behind there, with this technology going ahead. But if we now want to jump start and jump, jump ahead of the technological development, the only way that I see is with these huge gray areas and with that we become either blockers or we risk that we have other issues. But I think there's actually one important aspect to that as well, right? The EU AI Act, when it was first conceived, um, was precisely supposed to be um, technology neutral, right? To avoid specifically this problem that you're constantly running after the big latest thing, right? Um, I think there's still some challenges when it comes to that, right? And I think we've seen this as well. All of a sudden, ChatGPT became a big thing, like parliamentarians were scrambling to account for precisely these kinds of technologies. Um, but I mean, the EU AI Act is not the only regulation that applies to AI models, right? There are also overarching laws with regards to anti-discrimination, with regards to data protection, with regards to product liability, right, that we can draw on, I think, to um, regulate these models. So it's not as if these new technologies operate in a lawless space, right? There's existing law that can also be applied to these new technological developments that operate at a higher level and perhaps, therefore, will also be longer lasting, so to speak. Which in quite a few cases isn't done sufficiently. Right, and this, I think, is also a problem of education also at the legal level. And I think we need a lot more interdisciplinary education. You can't just have lawyers only with legal training in courts. Paola at Palantir, you're not serving the consumer, you are serving organizations. So how does an organization like Palantir anticipate these sort of risks? I'm not talking about the regulation, but the risk associated with AI. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as mentioned in the beginning, we build software platforms that are used for a wide variety of applications, right? That might be in the government realm, but it might also be in the commercial realm, ranging from um, the energy transformation to healthcare, to health insurance, to communication, transportation. Um, so there is not just one use case for our platforms. And unlike a lot of other Silicon Valley companies, we also don't make money by monetizing personal data, right? We provide the platforms and our customers use those platforms to lawfully work with the data that they already have. Um, but that also means, of course, that um, they are depending on how the final version of the EUA Act ends up looking, right, which we do not yet know, um, probably it will be a very context-specific assessment whether um, the environment in which our platform is used by our customers for a specific purpose will be a high-risk application or not. And that's an interesting challenge, I think, that we and a lot of other companies will need to prepare for, for this context-specific analys analysis and the kind of obligations that go along with that. That said, I think at a higher level and particularly at a technical level, um, there's a lot of requirements that the AI Act proposes that are actually highly sensible, right? Independent of whether it's a high-risk application or not with regards to data governance, data quality, right? The ability to um, evaluate whether the models are effective or not, right? Energy consumption is an interesting new aspect that the European Parliament added, right? 
Um, so I think there are certain kind of good engineering practices that are there and that probably makes sense regardless of whether it's a high-risk application or not, but there's a whole host of organizational obligations with regards to documentation, risk management, quality management, right? Um, uh, that only apply to high-risk AI systems, and that would be a very context-specific um, analysis, and I think that would be challenging to implement. And before all of you, don't think about founding a company on AI, because that bureaucracy was too much. We tried to fight for small and medium enterprises not to be taken into account by, these, uh, by these, all these, these regulations, at least as long as you're small or medium. Can we stay with you? How much time do you and your colleagues worry about uh, social media regulation by opposition to OER regulation? Ah, uh, yes. Sorry. Um, no, no, this is, uh, the, uh, my, me and my colleagues, we are only responsible for the AI regulation, not for the social media regulation. So this is kind of, um, this is an obvious answer. It's much more for that. But the thing is, I think both go in hand because we have seen, especially on how democracies, um, struggle with um, the impact of social media, which is AI-enhanced systems that kind of, um, you, you all know this, right? So this, the problem is um, that if social media habits and social media algorithms um, change our way to perceive things because it, they feed us certain news and others not, then obviously it is an AI application problem. And, but there is a lot of uh, uh, regulation coming for social media um, anyways. Plus, there is the, the education issue that you mentioned already. And I am actually, I'm a historian, one of the things. And this is why I always ask, uh, when, the, when the discussions start about deep fakes, I always start with Stalin. So this is, it's great that you mentioned that because this is obvious. We need, to, we need people consuming information to actually doubt the information first. And then maybe believe the information instead of the other way around, as it is now. Now we believe the picture, and somebody tells us, "Oh, that was fake." And then, yeah, oh, we didn't know. But then you should doubt the image first, because in the next three, five years, we will be flooded with misinformation and fake news. Beyond speaking of images, uh, if I go to Stable Diffusion and I ask for a painting of a panel of uh, three distinguished speakers on the eye in the style of Vermeer, I'm going to get four marvelous choices. If I ask the same thing on the style of Bonsky, should Bonsky get royalties? I believe that Sorry. We, yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. So um, I believe that we should take our societies with the development of AI technologies, living in the open dem democratic societies that we're in. And that means that artists should have a say, should have an opt-out um, option, um, that their data should not be utilized for training if they so decide. And this has been realized with Stable Diffusion now. Um, just by the way, that was one of the points where we actually decided to go for open source <laughs> because you can now see that there's been a ton of Silicon Valley companies out there who had used, hmm, why did they offer you email for free and whatever for free, right? Because that served as training data. It's only that they never say how they actually trained and even up till now, they don't tr uh, say where and how they actually got their training data. Now, for the first time, it however seemed that the general audience, the general public realized what that actually means um, to train such models. And um, with this awareness, then comes the point, like, how do we take pe people with us? I, however, must say that this is not a static thing. We've seen that with the music industry. The music groups who were most offended and most against actually sharing and whatever else are now the ones that first share their new content on YouTube and whatever else it is, just because there is the general public. There they actually can exert reach. And I guess we will see the same thing here as well. This will develop. Now there's an outcry and a lot potentially want to have opt out, I guess this will change and then artists actually want, would want to be in there, but it should be their saying uh, because we want to take the people with the development, not do it against. Actually, YouTube is probably the platform which is the best when it comes to monetization and respect for reality of artists. So do you envisage a time when micropayment would be embedded into AI? So we have this with the GEMA, for instance, a way to actually distribute. I'm, I'm told like there's a lot of bureaucracy involved in that as well. One can do that definitely better. But um, when there are in the future companies I mean, that, that are worth billions of dollars based on this generative AI technology, I can see that contributors to the success there, to the data, for instance, at the end of the day also would want to receive something. Now, that goes back in the direction of what I said beforehand. We do 
have this legislation already. We have established it anywhere. When you buy a coffee machine, there is a certain thing that actually goes to artists and so on. We have this in the music industry as well. Why not do this here as well? This isn't that special when it comes down to, to uh, like um, how we actually design credit there. Liability is special. Mm -hmm. Liability will be addressed. Obviously, liability is one of the huge problems, just for you to understand what it means, is if I use stable diffusion, and then, but I am a small and medium company that offers a product to a customer and I uh, use your technology, we both have an agreement. I give you royalties, you give me the technology, and you buy it from me, and you have a problem with it, you're going to sue me, but can I sue him? Because he can just say, look, that was not part of my model that you bought and that you tried to implement. You must have added that feature. It wasn't me. So in the end, um, it kind of um, makes things regarding liability very, very important, A, and B, very, very complex, and this is why we need to address that issue, because this is honestly one of the things that are new by its heart. Marco, one of the usual clothes, if you want to set to large organization, is that the company that will procure to another company will define if there is an IP issue. Can these be implemented for AI? I'm, I'm honestly not sure whether I got that question. In most of the procurement contract for large organization, the company which will procure with another software company yes. will ask to be defended if the provider of the technology is going to be attacked with respect to royalty rights. Do you think that this is something which can be implemented with AI? I, this is this is exactly at the heart of the discussion about the, the AI liability directive that's going to be coming because um, there there is not a, there, we have not yet settled on um, on, a, on a system and we have not settled on the mechanics. The mechanics are super complex and in from a ministerial point of view, Ministry of Economic Affairs, it's of utmost importance that people want to use that technology in companies, especially in small and medium companies all over Europe. Which means that you cannot just say that the big companies can um, force the small and medium enterprises to yeah yeah I give you this model but I'm not lying sign the contract, otherwise don't use the technology. Because if this is the result, small and medium enterprises will not use it, they will, they will fall behind in the global competitive market, and this is bad for Europe as a whole. Paula Palantir, is there Paula in Asia and Paula in the US, and what do you guys discuss about? Uh, I suppose if you're asking about regulatory fragmentation and how to deal with the challenge well, of that. Not tea, in, uh, not, not the quality of tea or coffee. <laughs> yeah, 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 and also not the multiplication of me personally, I suppose, across continents. I don't think AI is that fired, um, <laughs> thankfully. Um, no, I mean, I think, I think it's an obvious challenge, right? Um, and we see this already with data protection law. I mean, I mentioned originally that the EU General Data Protection Regulation inspired a lot of similar le legislation around the world, um, but it's similar, it's not the same, right? For instance, like various US states, right, have implemented privacy legislation that does not, however, and also understandably use the exact terminology as the EU, right, which is their good right as well because they regulate locally. Um, that said, um, I think for many reasons it makes sense for um, sort of like um, liberal democratic countries to also work together um, and to try and and negotiate uh, a greater harmonization of laws as well simply because for international companies there's an enormous internationally operating companies there's an enormous cost associated with regulatory fragmentation um, which I think then can have harmful effects as well on innovation right like if you're a small company starting up and you do want to sort of expand um, you will just need to invest a lot of resources if you have to kind of take into consideration all the different sort of local flavors of the same concept. Before we open to the audience, and given that I assume that 99% of people here, including this stage, are, are enthusiasts, what's AI for good? What's the benefit of AI? And I will ask each of you about this question. Finish. There's so many things. If I were to just pick one, it's going a bit against kind of the stream. And that is, you, we always think of like big companies benefiting from that. But what I actually see is AI bringing power, if, we, if it's really democratized, bringing power to the people. Um, the big tech companies already have the technology there, but if it's truly democratized, it means that you essentially will also have a very powerful tool that so far you did not have, which gets you closer to a level ground. I mentioned in my talk this example of arbitrary uh, everyday users using that to negotiate their telephone bills against companies, which before and had very clever thought out jurisdiction and whatever else that the AI can actually help us and help the individuals here negotiate an ever more complicated world uh, to their benefit. Marco? On a meter level, understand physics and the universe, and on the ground level, sorry, fighting and overcoming cancer. I think this is the most beneficial thing that's coming out of the next 20 years for some. Paula? 
Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to pick one. Um, I mentioned one that because it's an anecdote that I also recently just read about in, in the news as well. Um, a German medical association was basically um, getting quite exasperated because essentially doctors um, and pharmacies are facing ever amounting amounts of bureaucracy, right? To the extent that that's something they called for maybe only opening, opening doctor's offices four days a week so you can deal one day just with the bureaucracy. This, I think, is a clear area where, you know, we have the tools available today already to make a massive uh, difference, right? And actually, if this is of interest, like We're we as well, um, <laughs> like our platforms are used to sort of facilitate and make scheduling at hospitals more efficient. Like you, you may know that after the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a massive backlog with regards to sort of operations of regular patients. So our platform is used in the UK to make these scheduling processes more efficient such that patients who need to get care can get to the hospital where that care is available the quickest way available possible, right? So I think these are actually tools that are available today already where we can make, we use very little to make a massive difference. Excellent. Before we move to the question, can you guys applaud this terrific panel? <laughs> so who's got a question? And just so that you realize I can't see anything. I can see someone with their hands raised, but why don't, why don't I come to you and you, you ask the question? Okay, thank you. Can you say who you are as well? Yes, I am Silke Hahn from Heidelberg. Um, I'm a science and technology journalist. Um, I've got a question for you, Paula and Palantir. Um, sorry to crash the party, but um, when I returned from the Republika conference, the train stopped in Erfurt at the main train station and there was a big advertisement for an art exhibition, Dimensions, in Leipzig. And um, it was announced there's a sponsorship by Palantir and Deutsche Telekom. And I remember from the news coverage that the artists actually were not quite happy about Palantir being publicly announced as their sponsor. They even protested against Palantir as being the sponsor. I'm not going to talk now about the military platform that is also um, released by Palantir, but perhaps um, I would like to ask about art washing. Um, and what is your take on that? Sure, I mean, I think there's basically a lot to unpack there. It's true that we're a company that has decided from the beginning to work in challenging areas, right? We're not a B2C company. We were founded in the beginning of the 2000s following the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks, where there was essentially a challenge that government agencies had all the data that they needed to prevent the attacks, but they didn't have the infrastructure to effectively use that data in a controlled manner, right? And the irony associated with that, of course, is that They had all the data. They also didn't need to pass all these other laws, essentially, to enable security organizations to collect more data, right? So I think this also points to the fact that if you have effective tools at your disposal to work with data in an effective and a controlled way, then maybe you don't also need all these other sort of intrusive laws, right? But I think to your meta point, um, yes, because we work in sensitive areas, we also work with police agencies in Germany, right? I think we are oftentimes also used in a way as a kind of... Um, Uh, lightning rod, I think, for a lot of conversations in society that need to be had, right? What is the role of software companies when it comes to security? You mentioned military, right? Um, our software is currently used by the Ukraine, right, to defend itself against the Russian war of aggression. Um, AI for good does not only mean AI for feel-good topics, right? I think we face massive challenges as a society, also at the security realm. We have a war in Europe, right? Um, and I think we, as a society, but also we as technology companies, need to think about what is our role in that, right? Um, I think it's a very easy solution to say, like, look, I'm just going to lift my hands, and this is like, very challenging, I'm going to keep out of it. We as a company decided we're going to roll up our sleeves, and we're going to try and make a, a positive difference. But we have also taken a clear stance, right? We align ourselves with Western with liberal democratic values, right? Like We're a United States company, and we're also proud of that. We work with our allies in Europe, too. And I think we see currently the importance of these democratic alliances, right? We don't work with China. We also don't work with Russia. Many companies do not take the stance. But I understand that these are challenging areas. Um, but I believe that we have a role to play in that. Just sort of protesting and not taking a stance um, is at least a position that I personally would not take. Please. Um, there was a lot of talk uh, about Oh, yes. I'm, I'm Sebastian. I'm studying currently at the LMU. Uh, I'm studying informatics, um, going in the data science direction. I was, ask, uh, I was just wondering, there was a lot of talk of the democratizing of uh, AI, but what about the democratizing of democratizing? I don't know the word. Um, 
thank you uh, of the data used to train the models because if we don't have access to the data from google from facebook whatever to the large language data they have um it doesn't help us to have wonderful open source ais if we don't have data to train them yeah um i, I evidently as a scientist for a long time we were seeing um, the big companies there sitting on a lot of data and um, it seemed like it's going in the way that they can actually only do the thing. Now we luckily have in Germany, for instance, a Lion Initiative and uh, similar entities that started to collect large amounts of data from the Internet, which is publicly available there. Um, and um, that now for the scientific community has become really um, the baseline and the basis for a lot of research that is out there. To what extent this can and should be used in um, uh, commercial applications, what additional filtering should go in there, this is part of uh, a currently ongoing discussion there. I must say we are definitely much better off than we used to be beforehand. And um, still, the big companies have private data there that we don't have access to. But I guess it's also worth a discussion to what extent that should be used um, for training such models and what then to do with those models. I could bore you to death with uh, the um, um, an ex um, with talking about for 10 minutes about the EU Data Act that assesses these things and the Digital Markets Act that assesses these things, but just keep in mind that there is rules about that. But I think what's, what, what the next step is, as these generative AI models are being integrated in search engines, this is going to make the problem worse. Anyone? Yes, over there. Hi, my name is Sabine Donauer. I work for the Bavarian Digital Ministry here. And my question goes to Björn Ommer. Since you have many times mentioned we shouldn't run into a resource scarcity in terms of compute infrastructure. So um, what do you think about the Liam initiative saying we should buy like all the um, NVIDIA GPUs for Germany to build up a, a GPT uh, ready yeah, compute infrastructure. And that also goes a little bit to uh, your neighbor from the BMW cars since that money should obviously come from the German economic ministry. <laughs> yeah, so first off, um, I, I was there in, in, in spring in Berlin when the Liam Initiative um, announced their, their paper and had a similar panel discussion there. Um, I think, as I said beforehand, that resource independence will be key for us to even be in the position to talk about legislation in this particular field and also will be very important for our future progress and uh, here making money and, and living the lives that we actually would want to, to live and not become overly dependent from the outside. The Liam Initiative is uh, pushing forward in this um, direction that we have here in Germany and then beyond that, as you know, there are also European initiatives um, uh, that, that try to jump in there. Um, I guess it isn't fully fleshed out and from Berlin, from political circles, I, mean, I have been talking quite a bit there, but there's evidently still a lot to decide there, like where we would want to go. Um, if anything, we need to do this very quickly. We've seen how much and how quickly the landscape has been changing in half a year. I must say I found this very worrisome that uh, there were actors from big companies out that in spring said uh, we should all stop research here while at the same time, while at the same time they were bu buying 10,000s of GPUs and founding companies in that direction and actually working on models that they wanted others to actually stop research with. I, should, I think we should take this very carefully in account here in Germany and in Europe. And um, I believe that a German initiative would be very important. I guess a Bavarian one would also kind of be helpful for what we're having here in infrastructure. And top of that, linking that together in the European Union uh, would be um, something that we should also consider. There have been recently also proposals in that direction. I would be a little bit careful just going too large and then hoping that everything gets uh, consolidated on the European level because that's a, typically a recipe for, well, I don't say like this <laughs> nothing, but uh, for, for just prolonging things. And if we want to have quick action, we've seen over the last year that quick action is possible. I guess it's needed. Marco, do you want to add something? No, I don't want to, but I probably am forced. Um, 
because why do I not want to? We paid for the study. This is um, it's my department that actually made this. We planned it. We were in close talks with Lehman Initiative. I was at the same event, having a panel, not with you, but with others. And we are in close contact with the, the KI Bundesverband, the German AI Association, that's kind of driving things ahead there. The problem is today is Thursday. Yesterday was Wednesday, and the German cabinet um, um, decided on the budget on the federal budget for the next uh, years and the years to come. And there is, as far as I have seen, not yet a decision taken on the digital budget, which we were planning, um, and you can read that in the digital strategy, to fund um, things like Liam Initiative from, which means I am still a supporter, but as of now, I don't have any money. Do we have I didn't want to answer. I ended my talk by saying, like, we can make a difference if we want to. <laughs> We have another question. By the way, the CEO of NVIDIA was in Berlin on, uh, on Tuesday. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, we will repeat your question. So thank you very much. Okay, I, uh, I see this as a very important point. Uh, so the question is how to educate the public because AI is complicated. Um, so I, I do this on several levels, evidently, within the university, direct to the next generation, which I believe will become multipliers, that then can educate others in that. Um, I had numerous of press interviews, more than I can count, I, uh, per week. Um, because I feel this very important to get a few things right, especially directions uh, that that I believe were a little bit on a tangent from uh, big companies uh, from from outside of our country and, uh, and continent, um, uh, talking to politics there as well. At the same time, <laughs> giving talks and so on, where I hope I can explain things in a little bit more understandable manner uh, than I do on scientific conferences. And uh, lastly, we and others are doing research in the direction that uh, we develop algorithms that where the algorithms explain the AI. So you have an AI that tries to explain what the other AI is doing in human, more understandable terms. But apparently, this is ongoing research. This is by no means done, and this will be a bit of a chicken and egg thing as new models actually come about. And lastly, to to enter in there. I think with making these models democratic, opening them up, talking about like how the training actually goes on, that was actually a big leap in that direction. Because now you have a lot of people actually discussing what does that mean, training these models? What does it mean to actually utilize this training data? Although not everybody understands how these models work, whether these are the artificial human being or not. I mean, these are different stories, but I guess we need to educate the uh, general public on the different aspects that we have there and I can only do like one at a time. And if I may add one thing, you can thank GPT um, for having a public attention now. Because um, you showed, you have a very, very nice presentation, by the way. Um, you, you, he showed um, these Spiegel um, uh, covers from the last 40 years, always trying the robot's going to take my blue collar job away. And for the first time in the history of AI, as far as I'm aware of at least, we are talking about white collar jobs now. We are talking about creative jobs. We are talking about journalists. And at the, at this, at the exact moment when journalists felt threatened by AI, they were starting to give some some credit to it, and the, the whole thing, the whole topic, um, has uh, has taken off. So right now, why we are having this discussion, why he has so many interviews and has this great presentation, he's going to uh, um, give us at uh, uh, Republika in Berlin and now here in Munich and everywhere else, is because the attention is there, because people feel now that AI is here, and it's not only a colleague robot that's going to take your job away, which is which he doesn't for 40 years now, but it's it's creative now. It can do some things that we never imagined that AI can do in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the job market.
Yeah, I, I would get this a little bit there out of the negative direction. Why are people talking about? Because now finally AI is working, right? I mean, it has been there and there was always that. I always get this question, is there the next AI winter coming? I can only say like, you go out there, there, there are products that you can use yourself. They're not perfect, but you can now judge beforehand. In previous waves, it was always like, I have one urine. If I just have a few billion more, maybe then I have the brain. But now we can say like, here, this, here is this thing. It's not perfect. Try it out and it's creating values. I guess that is actually the difference. You're perfectly, you're perfectly right. Perfectly right. Do not want to disagree? I, I just, I, I just noticed that the, 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 the debate about AI regulation has changed in the last six months twice, and the, for three months now it's okay, okay. We need to, we need to avoid catastrophe, and it hasn't been like that six months ago. There was, we need to avoid um, um, data leaks or something or something like biometric recognition. But now it's about we need to foster um, or we need to harness a generative AI and need to avoid catastrophe. This is why I feel more negative debate right now than it was six months ago. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sagar. I'm partner at Blockchain Founders Capital. And my question to you, Marco, I get it. Yes, uh, journalists and everyone might lose their job from AI, but how about government agencies? Like, at what level you guys are exploring to use the AI to make this uh, process faster? Do you have some discussion already going on at Ministry where you will use the AI to make things faster than it's already existing? And at what level it will make change? Thank you. First and foremost, I think that journalism is um, there. Will there will be a revival for high quality journalism? Because we will be flooded with so much noise that somebody needs to uh, take us by the hand and lead us through the real news. So this is why I think that journalists will actually profit from the from the AI situation as it is. The second one, yes, we are we're looking into AI procurement. Um, it, the, the, the federal level does this, and um, I know that um, municipalities are doing it too. It's usually not like um, um, not, not only uh, how can we use a chatbot that's going to talk to our citizens. It's more like having more um, 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 efficient procedures within the government, having a more digitized um, relationship with your citizens and stuff like that. So there's a lot of applications and there is a lot of people looking into this right now. And yes, even the federal government does that, but I am not a part of the, uh, of the procurement procedure, so I do not know exactly what they're doing. And Marco, I'm glad to let you know that there are two or three startups at Tomb which are exactly in this topic which can scale. I can connect you with the, with yes. the, the Berlin agencies. Guys, there's been a terrific... No, there's more questions. So let me go to another one, and then we'll have to stop. Uh, hi, my name is Max. I'm also studying informatics at the LMU. And um, my question would be, so if I got it correctly, um, you said that um, the, the process of democratizing um, AI consists of open data, open source, and open weights, if you say, could say so. Um, if th is there any approach um, for a... I, I would have added here that the most important thing was, and you having this thing does not really help you. The most important thing was making these models so small that you can personally run them on your own hardware. And that, okay, um, but all those things, is there any recipe or something um, that tries to combine those ideas and like give a direction for companies or something that you may have developed yet? Well, I mean, there is a direction out there, right? And that is, if, if that's your goal, to make it open, I mean, uh, there, there's not much more than I can say. Make it open source. And if your goal is to make sure that people can actually own the tech and can actually run it on their own hardware and not send the data over a big ocean into another country, into to a private uh, company, and have then their data being processed there and be dependent on that, then you make sure that you actually develop smaller models and make them more powerful. So if there's any any guideline that I can give, don't just aim for making things larger there. Yeah, I don't like the term like LLM, large language models. Why is their size anything of a feature, right? Powerful language models, they should be, not just large models. Guys, can you please give a big round of applause to the outstanding panel? <laughs>